conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat. Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is an exercise we call the K-Box Break Squats. This is an exercise that's kind of modified from one that Chris Corfus demonstrated in his sensational presentation at the seminar. To set up the K-Box for this, we use a belt, and we're going to make sure that the strap is long enough for us to get into full triple extension all the way up on our big toes. From there, we're going to sit into a squat and spin the wheel, and we're going to drive as hard as we can up. The goal of this exercise, then, is to keep our posture up, drive ourselves up as hard as we can, and then stop as fast as possible without our heels hitting the ground. What we love about this exercise is how it trains that braking force and for you to be strong in that stopping position to help carry over to change of direction and agility drills. Give this one a try. I'm sure it's one that your athletes will love and definitely see how it can be beneficial to their performance. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Mike, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Oh, Jay, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. You know, uh, following you for a long time, actually. And, uh, probably helped my development as a coach a lot, I would say. Well, I appreciate that, man. As full disclosure, we tried to do this once early, Rona, and then uh, we just talked for like an hour and 30 minutes and never recorded it, so I'm glad that we're able to get this down now. But uh, listen, man, let, let's give everybody a rundown about, you know, where you're at, how you got up there, and what you got cooking. Well, so let's see. Uh, I'm currently at Grove City College. It's a Division three private school about – a little over an hour north of Pittsburgh. Uh, we have, I'm the assistant strength and conditioning coach there. Uh, my, our head is uh, Coach Caleb Thrasher. Uh, this job kind of, you know, the synch synchronicity. Uh, I was working at the uh, Umberger Performance at the time. So, you know, Scotty, and uh, one of our athletes was a Grove City athlete. And uh, I was a slippery rock guy and they were looking for an assistant. They had just created the position and said, uh, they emailed some people at Slippery Rock and uh, one of my professors emailed me and said, hey, check this out. And I said to my athlete, I said, hey, isn't this your school? And she's like, yeah, and I'll put in a good word for you. Emailed back. They were like, I, I was thinking it wasn't going to be, you know, a great deal. And then I got up there and they were telling me, you know, here's the situation and here's, you know, compensation and whatnot. And I was like, wow, this is okay. This is, this is great. This is really good. And uh, going to there, I've been, uh, I've worked at Slippery Rock University, which is also North Pittsburgh, uh, volunteered and interned at Robert Morris over the last two years. And between that and before that, I've been uh, private strength conditioning, both independently and for Umberger Performance formerly. And right now, we're just trying to do our best to train 480 athletes with two coaches in the times of uh, COVID. Yeah. So for everybody complaining about all these extra responsibilities that we had, 480 kids. Woof. Yeah. And we both train everybody. You know, there's no like, oh, you just have these people. Like it's, you know, we have 23 varsity sports, I believe. That's uh, that's quite a load to carry there. I, I do want to say one thing, though, before we get going too far. I think that something needs to be said and a shout out needs to be given to Slippery Rock because that's a school that a lot of people don't know about that puts out a lot of really good coaches. 
And, you know, everybody likes to talk, I mean, I'm going to say it, like Cortland, right? And then Springfield, and then yeah. UW Lacrosse, or, or some that Westchester has a tendency to put out a bunch of good coaches. But oh, Spring, yeah. uh, Slippery Rock tends to get overlooked. So, like, that needs to be said. Like, they do a good job producing quality coaches at that institution. No, we absolutely have. And uh, it's, it was, it's a very fortunate. It's a very, if anybody decides to go there for exercise science, it's a hard program. So buckle your hat. We finished with about a third of the kids we started with. That's wild. <laughs> so that's wild. That no, there's that much of a drop rate. Um, but no, man, let's, let's talk about this past semester. Let's talk about some things that you guys learned and figured out because you said you've made some changes to how you guys have been handling it. Because, you know, again, like people are going to sit here and be like, well, you know, I've got to run my lacrosse team twice. Well, you guys got to run 23 teams multiple times. Yeah. So it's been interesting. We ended up, so we have so many athletes and we were just looking at, this is our weight room. This is our capacity. We have a weight room capacity of, if we have both coaches in there, 23 athletes. So very quickly, you can see the math just isn't going to work out over a day, a week, whatever, and everybody's going to have some form of adequate training. So very quickly, we're like, all right, we're going to split our weight room, we're going to split our equipment, and we're going to have our primary weight room. And then essentially, like, I don't want to use the phrase auxiliary weight room, because that doesn't do the area justice, but that's essentially what it ended up being, because we had to create it. So we split some of our weights down there, we left the racks in our primary weight room, moved dumbbells, kettlebells, bands, medicine balls, and that's basically it down there into onto essentially a large basketball court where we could also perform speed and agility work as part of our training. So we would work our weight room guys through in those sessions because wherever you started, you couldn't transition to another area. So if you started weight room, that's where you warmed up, lift, leave. If you started down in the, on our court, you warmed up down there, did your stuff, left. You went somewhere else. You were not allowed to cross from one area to another. So very quickly, this becomes, all right, if you're in the weight room, you're not going to be able to do very much uh, speed or agility work, and you're going to be very limited on any sort of jumping and plyometrics. On the flip side, our absolute loading requirement for certain athletes is going to be limited in our court weight room. So we very quickly had to say, all right, if you're, and this was maybe, you know, not to bully anybody, but if you're just not above a certain level of development, you're not going to be in the primary weight room. That was pretty much it. If you're lower down the scale of athletic development, you're just, you're going to be down here and we're going to work some fundamentals. And then for those sports that were more field-based, we tried to have them rotate through so they would have at least a day where they were doing speed and agility work down in our open area and working in some basic plyos with that. I don't think that's a bad tactic at all. Cause when you think about it, right? Like if what we're going to say is you got to give them what they need to develop. If all somebody needs is a pair of twenties to get their hinging pattern, right? Cause they can't do it or, you know, simple lunging things they can't do. Right. Why not take I don't know if we ever want to say take advantage of this time, but you know what I mean? Like no, take advantage of it to, to hone in on, be good at the small stuff so we can do the big stuff later. Exactly. And very quickly it turned into like, if we were down in that area, uh, you know, if we're in the weight room, if you're at your rack, there were some limits where like, okay, you can't really be going all over the place in the weight room. Like if you're at your rack, you essentially you're staying in like your pods within that area. Well, with our court weight room, we were, uh, had a little bit more freedom with that. And also, you know, because, all right, if our absolute load is limited, what are some things that maybe we can do from a training standpoint that work well in that situation? Well, you know, having known one by 20 system for, you know, at least four years now, I was like, well, it's not like I haven't done this before. Boom, perfect situation now where it actually works out really well that I can, you know, work on a variety of movements, you know make sure they're technically good and really take a chance to develop these. And like some of the teams we had down there were uh, softball and women's lacrosse. Women's lacrosse actually is in its first year ever. So they started in the fall last year and that was their introduction to training, unfortunately. But 
uh, you know, I felt even with those limitations that the people down there were getting good, solid training that's going to help them long term. Yeah, welcome to college athletics. Here's a pandemic. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you're not allowed to recruit yet. Oh, boy. And it's just like starting anew is hard enough. And then, you know, like, I don't know if people understand, like, the limitations that you guys have to begin with, with all of the stuff being off season in the fall anyway, mm -hmm. as opposed to now, like, now everything can be Kara. For those in, in not in America or not in college athletics, it's countable athletic related activities. So at times of the year, you have different levels of hours you can use. But in Division Three, in the offseason, there's no such thing. Entirely but, voluntary. Yeah. So, like, that had to be super challenging because nobody played. And now you go from nobody playing, basically, to everybody, everybody playing. So it went from, like, scattered to, like, everybody's here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it jumped up fast and, you know, it benefited us in some ways and it benefited us not so much in some other ways. We've got to find out very quickly what teams and uh, what teams basically had good cultures, like who's going to come in when they don't have to and be there. And, you know, uh, we've had we had a handful of transfers and some freshmen that are no longer on some teams as of the spring now who they they just decided like, hey, this just isn't for me because, you know, they were lamenting the situation. And as one of our coaches said, you know, if you can't see the bright side and understand like everything that's going on right now, then I'm not sure I wanted you on my team anyway. Because everybody is going through this. It's not like you're going to go to another school if you decide to transfer. And it's like, it's going to be completely different. Like, you know, global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, the first Everybody's word. Going through something. Yeah, the first word tells you there's nowhere to hide, right? And it's like, I think that's an interesting way to look at it too because you you look at some of how the pundits, if you may, ha have kind of talked about it in looking at athletes who have opted out or whatever and, and their opinions of that. But hearing a coach say that if you weren't going to do this stuff, maybe you, you know, weren't the right person it's it's it that's a unique way to look at it, especially in today's society right where it's like all of the intricacies when it comes to allowing decisions and this and that yeah comma if you're at school why wouldn't you, you know, like I, I mean and this is just me being a guy who like if I don't have like a full schedule, I have no idea what to do with my life. So I couldn't imagine having like my eight o'clock class, first of all, moved to 7.15 or whatever, because that's what they did at our school because they had to split everything up. So like okay. each one hour class is now three one hour classes. Cool. So now that, so it'd be like, instead of just the eight o'clock section of 15 people, there's five at seven, five at eight, five at nine, or something like that. Gotcha. I don't know, they were telling me, and I'm just like, it, this doesn't matter for me. I don't care. But then now, let's say you went from eight to seven, and now you have a break until, like, you would have time from nine to 10 to get breakfast and then class at 10. Well, now I got a break from eight to 10. I have no idea what to do with myself. Like, I would want someone to be like, yo, Jay, get in the gym. Like, this is our time. Let's go. And, like, so understanding that that structure could actually help you as a former Division Three guy, uh, I think that is something that these kids tend to overlook at times. No, definitely, hundred percent. And you know, what's uh, I think John Gordon in uh, one of his books said, you know, get the right people on the bus and get the wrong people off the bus. In some ways, you know, the hard situations will do that for you. And you know, everybody will talk about building your culture. And, you know, I tend to be on the side of like, well, you should probably try to recruit the right guys. Cause by the time they get to college, I'm not sure if you're changing who they are. Yeah, like, no doubt. Maybe, but I think that's going to be hard. 
And if, we say, if we're going to put this big like culture piece down, then that's going to be who you are and then recruit the right guys. And Hey, if it's self-selecting to an extent this year, all right, we're going to be better in the years to come. Yeah. And I also think too, that, you know, the extra challenges that we're all going through that, you know, no one ever would have wished on anybody ever this craziness is doing what I think we've all thought some of these like psychological aspects of training does all along. And that's really kind of expose the good and the bad as opposed to training those yeah. type of behaviors why do the seals go through hard training it's not to make guys mentally tough it's to find out who is mentally tough you know and like if that's the situation we're going to be in you know look up we got to find the bright side and everything because if you just start finding the bad and everything that quickly becomes a vicious cycle and then you get down you're going to bring the people around you down and then you know everybody's going to be worse for it and you know like in the fall already not ideal training situation. <laughs> we ended up only getting, depending on the team, seven or eight weeks of training done out of a 16-ish week semester because of shutdowns and breakouts on campus. We actually ended up going to Thanksgiving break, I think a week or two early because it just wasn't, at that point, if you were going to get quarantined, it was going to last through break anyhow. So you might as well just like, all right, if it is safe for you to go home, maybe you guys should go home is essentially what our university said. Yeah. And I understand where they're coming from with that because that's hard at that point. Right. Is it, especially too, like there was everywhere, there seemed to be like a spike around Halloween and yeah. then a spike getting close to the end because it was near the end. So mm -hmm. they thought that everything was okay. But, you know, when we look at the training situation that you guys had to deal with, you know, looking at different levels, let's talk a bit about how you guys separated people. Like what were any sort of evaluations or like numbers or whatever that you had that would say, you're going to train here, or you're going to train there, or you're level one and you're level two. So we kind of based it on with at the school, how developed overall the team was and demand on weight room and also we took culture into account as an aspect like if you haven't been a good weight room team for us in the past or if we've had teams that were better than you you weren't necessarily bad but if this team is in every day and in voluntary workouts has a hundred percent like attendance rate they're gonna they get dibs before you and that's essentially like how we tended to look at it so big to first developmental level so we ended up i think it was Cross country, softball, women's lacs, and with men's basketball, baseball, and men's lacs rotating through to get speed and agility work done, assuming that, you know, some of those teams almost had a fall ball, so we needed to have some sort of prep for that. And then basketball, obviously, being a winter sport, we weren't sure what the nature of that was going to look like at the end of the semester. So we said, well, they've got to be ready to go for that on some level. So we had those teams rotating through and the others in their, uh, essentially in their entirety outside of their sport practice. You know, I think that's kind of a breath of fresh air too, that you guys did look at it that way. Cause I, I think all too often what staffs are kind of timid about would be saying to teams like you don't get what the other teams get because you don't do what the other teams do and you don't treat us the way these other teams treat us and then it's good to hear that you guys reward those who are bought in and are committed to what you guys are trying to do yeah and like even within teams like oh tennis and tennis was other the ones that we had in down there entirely even within teams that have historically had issues, there's still plenty of bright spots. And pretty much we were fortunate in the fall where we had that as a consideration going in. And by and large, none of those issues came to fruition. 
So like all of, we're at a point now, fortunately, where like team cultures, I'm not sure we have a bad one on any of our teams. In fact, I'm, we don't. I, I can say offhand, we don't have a bad team culture on any of them. We just have some now that are just better than others. Women's basketball, for example, our women's basketball team is highly dedicated to every process about being a student athlete. And it's awesome to see. Well, and those are the groups too that like, especially in these times that are challenging are gonna be the funnest ones to work with and are gonna help really you pick up for the rest of the day for everybody else. Oh yeah, that's love training. Men's and women's basketball is always fun because we used to have men's basketball late in the day. And man, at the end of like a 10 or 11 hour, like long day, and then like they're coming in like, you know, juiced up. I'm like, all right, good. I needed this. <laughs> Like they're, they don't, they didn't know it, but they were helping me get through. No. It, yeah. And I think that that's important because, you know, they've got to be able to pick you up as much as you do with them. So now let's look at this going forward. Now, how do you see these challenges as we continue to progress and where do you see some lessons learned from the fall to help when it comes to making sure things can continue to move in a proper direction? Oh, let's see. Well, all right. So sending everybody home over the winter. Winter is typically not a great time to train for most sports that aren't indoors. And especially worse when everything that is also indoors is shut down. So we had athletes who, so who we have back right now, the basketballs and swimming. Well, a lot of places talking to our athletes, they had no access to courts. They had no access to any sort of training grounds, fields, parks, uh, swimming, if you want to do swimming, you know, you can't just use your neighbor's pool. Like you need at least some length to practice your stroke. And, you know, you're really, really, really lucky if you get an Olympic pool. So, you know, taking that into account for like our teams now, or, you know, their training situations probably weren't ideal. A lot of them didn't have gym access. We tiered our off season programs into like full gym access minimal equipment so they have like something the beginnings of a home gym and level three you don't even have a pull-up bar <laughs> and you know a lot of people had a, a fair amount of people had that level three and coaches can say well we want them on level one and like that's just not you know if it wasn't happening for them it's not happening for them there's nothing we can do about that so moving forward and like the athletes we have back now looking at that like some of our coaches have already said like, okay, our workloads are going to have to be lighter because like our swim coach said this, like there are people that didn't have a pool for like two months. So like, we just can't jump in and be like, all right, everybody's on point and ready to go for uh, the swim season. And our basketball coaches have real have, well, they knew that going in. So we don't have to worry about that too much, but it's like, okay, everybody's so far so good. Like there hasn't been any catastrophic, injury uh issues our first few weeks back which is good now taking this information we have based on our winter sports for our spring sports that will be starting in two weeks here and saying okay this is what we've seen so far with our athletes have come back their training hasn't been ideal if you needed to practice your sport or do any sort of physical prep it probably wasn't even optimal so like minimal maybe but, you know, if you need a pool, there's no subbing for a pool. If you need batting practice and all the batting cages are closed and you don't have a pitcher, you just have a tee, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same. If you're a pitcher, you know, you need some place to throw. And if you don't have that, that's going to be an issue. So, like, thinking about our various sports coming back and, you know, the weight room, in my opinion, is easy to modify. I can say we're going to pull back, we're going to start with this volume and this load and something basically I know, I know you can do this today and then we'll work up over time because if I undercut it a little bit, fine, you just add more. If I overdo it even a little bit, you know, that starts to snowball into who knows what and we're trying to avoid that and right now like for me, the weight room's not even a big aspect of what we're trying to do. You know, we need to be prepared for practice. And we need to be prepared for competition and getting people to competition is more important than more important than the weight room. And to me, it's more important than practice. 
So like if I, you know, talk to a coach and say, hey, coach, what are you doing when they come back? And somebody says, we're going two hours, six days a week. <sighs> Crap. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's the way to go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So start to have like these conversations where, hey, if we know people have had no ability to train and prepare for their sport, you're going to have to take some example of like, you know, this is, uh, we, if we don't modify, you might end up losing valuable players or a certain portion of your roster that you didn't have to lose for some, you know, time loss injury. And even after they come out of that, we'll have to work them back up again. So do we want to learn the lessons that other sports have learned? You know, because what soccer came back and immediately like first two or three weeks, they were like muscle pulls and tendon issues all over the place. So we already know what, and, those, and my point to the coach is we're putting a document together. What have we seen from teams that have come back and places that have come back? What do we know? to risk factors for injuries, you know, high speed running, change of direction, massive jumps in training load, basically. And what do we do about that? So, you know, progressive practice periods, uh, you know, having our lower intensity drills in our early weeks and then progressing our the intensity of our drills up higher, uh, limiting snap counts for, you know, are really important players perhaps, or guys that tend to be injury prone. Uh, we have two players on one of our teams who uh, have historically had a lot of hamstring issues and we've had, we've been working them through, but are they gonna be ready for day one level uh, of running that they're gonna need to do at practice? No, almost certainly not. <laughs> so having these conversations and Kier I think put out a tweet a few days ago where he was talking about uh, having these, it was essentially about having these conversations with coaches. And I think the first thing he said is they have to be aware of it. The second thing I believe was they have to understand it. And the third thing is they have to care. So we're trying to make them aware and make them understand it. But at some point, like I can't make them care about it. They have to care about it. And that's sort of the situation we're at right now. And not everybody's done it poorly. Like, cause clearly Alabama and Ohio state just played. And I don't know if anybody saw that, but Bama played 12 games and Ohio State played six in a COVID year. And Bama looked faster and fresher. They just did. And I know this was like a big win for the strength and conditioning world. And everybody was like, this is the revolution that we needed. And, you know, unless the decision makers see that the same way, I don't think it's going to have the impact everybody seems to think. But that's an aside. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm 100% with you on that. And I think, too, that like, Another thing that people are overlooking, and this was a conversation that I had with, you know, a bunch of people on our staff and when we were having these meetings early on is like, yo, like, are we ready for when we're going to have to do all this again in the spring? Like, you know, we had all these progressions and these work backs and like these boxes that people had to tick and you had to be able to get to X, com you know, conditioning stuff and Y and mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yo, what are we going to do when they come back and they have to compete? P.S. Yep. They're coming back in January where most of these kids are from the Northeast, where I don't like walking my dog right now because it's 29 degrees in the morning. Could you imagine trying to run in Rhode Island? No, no. no. Outside, like just for general fitness, like long, slow distance. Like if they can't even do that with, with what can they do? And we're looking, and I think that your example, like with, um, the big one was the Bundesliga, right? Where they had like the groins and the yeah. Achilles oh, and yeah. all that. Let's also remember too, that was summer. Like that was warm. Like now we got kids going out here on field turf or astro turf or grass, if you're lucky. And it's freaking January and February. Like. 100%. Like we need to make sure and it's you know i i think that i mean obviously karen and i agree on a lot of things obviously you know because we're so tight but i think that that third point is the one that frustrates strength coaches the most because 
people don't always necessarily see the importance of the things that we're talking about because it's not something they're used to and it's not what they grew up with. And it's always just kind of been like show up and go. And right, right now, grind, yeah. And I think right now, this is another thing, a, a positive byproduct of this pandemic is people are now, lack of a better term, being forced and hamstrung into the point of having to care about those things. Yeah. And, you know, looking for positives. I'm hoping long term that that carries over into a normal year that we say, because so we're going to play spring football. We have five games. We're going to play in the fall. And we're going to play a full slate in the fall, as I mean, planned right now from that standpoint. So what are we going to be able to do in the spring that has them as prepared for these games as possible that's not also going to ruin the fall? Because I don't care what anybody says, regular spring ball in preparation for playing in the fall is not the same as playing five real games. Like, it's just the intensity level is not going to be the same. The competitive level is not going to be the same. Like, spring ball doesn't go on your record. This is going on people's record. And I don't think that people understand the ramifications of playing a football schedule in February and March and then maybe April. Physically, mm -hmm. the toll that that's going to have on these young people when they're supposed to come back for camp in August. Oh, yeah. You're looking at, you know, rule of thumb, for every game you play, that's a minimum of a week that your body's going to need just to, like, get back to normal. So if we play five games, we're looking at, on the short side, five weeks just for them to feel, start to feel okay again. And on the, it may be up to 10. So if yeah. we're looking at that, we end in April, you know, 10 weeks, two and a half months, that's going to go May, June, July till they're feeling okay again, potentially. Well, and heaven forbid somebody needs to have like something repaired. Yeah. And I think that's why you see a lot of these kids in the spring seasons opting out because it's just not. No, if, if they're, if they're, yeah. if they have the chance, you know, if they have the chance to go to a league, I don't blame, I don't blame at all ever when anybody does that. Uh, and if they're going to be coming back for another year and they're going to play a full season and have a better opportunity to be prepared for that, you know, I'm not going to, if anybody chooses to, Absolutely. Go for it. I'm hundred percent on your side. Cause at the end of the day, like you are part of a team, but you are also responsible for your well being. And that's probably not a popular opinion. And, you know, we see this every year when uh, the NFL draft opt outs and guys are like, I'm not playing the bowl game. Sorry guys. And I'm like, you know, people rip on those guys. And I'm, you know, Jalen Smith, was a first round guaranteed draft pick coming out of Notre Dame, blew his knee up in the bowl game, dropped to the second round, lost millions of potential dollars. Like if you have that kind of opportunity, absolutely. Like, don't worry about this. And even if you just want to like have a full fall season, let's like make the best choice that is going to be for you. Well, and you also, you know, I think that when people get into that, the, the fun byproduct of that conversation is, well, what about the coaches who take jobs before those subsequent bowl games that aren't playoff games that bounce? Like, oh, yeah. no one seems to have a problem with that. It, me included. I don't have a problem with it either way, right? Like, you've got to be able to take care of number one, like, and it's a business move. Like that's it. Yeah. But like, don't sit here. Right. Like um, it was a kid from Florida. I think this year that like maybe a tight end it's supposed to be a first round pick. He decided not to play in the bowl game. All of a sudden Twitter goes full butthurt. Right. Oh yeah. It's like, but like, what about a coordinator 
who gets a head job at the end of the season and skips a bowl game. No one bats an eye. Like, no. how is that different? Like, why are we punishing a kid who's like, listen, we're not playing for a championship. Who's not getting paid at all. Who's not getting paid. And also, it's called the postseason. He's finished his obligation. He's, he's done his job. He's probably leaving school anyway. So he's giving up his scholarship. Like, what? What? Yeah. What's, what's the problem? Why are we picking that? Like, leave the kid alone. Like, if you had the opportunity, if you were like, yo, you're probably going to have a chance to make $100 million. But you also have a 50-50 chance of getting injured in this game that could cost you that $150 million. Oh. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why people get so angry about that. Like, why? So the coaches don't get their bonus? Well, the kid wasn't going to get the bonus. Like, and the kid played the whole season. Like, he got you to where you, I don't know. That's just, that's just why I don't, like, look at Twitter very often. Because I'm just like, what? Like, No, no, hey, every day. Like, what strength coach Twitter upset about today? Yeah, you know, dude. Maybe tomorrow they're going to be upset. Well, or, or well, I guess whenever this would go out, they're going to, you know, strength coach Twitter is going to be in an uproar about things that got said here. Like, all right. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, it's just like. Why are we fighting over a kid making a decision to take care of his family when a coach can make that decision to take care of his family and we're just like, no, cool. Whatever. You know what we're like? We're like, do you have any connections? I want to jump on and get a job with him. That's what strength coaches are like. They're like, oh, the coordinator left? Let me call my boy or let me call my girl. Let me see if I can hop on there and get another job in an FBS program. Am I, going, when the, am I moving on up? <laughs> yeah. And then when the kid does it, it's like somebody even said something like they should pay back their past tuition. And it's like, word, like, have you ever done a job and then finished it and left and then been like the work I did before? I'm going to pay you back for it. Like, that's insanity. No, absolute madness. And like, that school, I mean, if you look at football, that school is going to make millions off of football. Millions. Mm -hmm. And those, I mean, it's the old, like, you know, paying players. They're not going to see that money. No. So if they have a potential to make money or think about their health, you know, I'm 100% okay with that. And, no. you know, it is what it is. But it comes back to, like, People have to understand that and, you know, they have to care. Yeah. And like, that's our big thing right now, getting coaches to understand and be aware and care. Yeah. And it's the same idea, like what your coaches were saying before is that the kids don't want to do this stuff. They don't want to be part of the program. Like, why are you forcing them to do it? Like yeah. if it's a decision that they feel is best for them, whether it's the coach saying, then you don't fit the culture, or it's the kid saying, I don't want to risk the opportunity. Who cares? It's just not a fit. And at that moment, it's the best decision for everybody to just let it go and leave it be. And that's you know, it. Do you want somebody who's not all in on your team? And then yeah. especially like, all right, if it's whatever, somebody way down the roster, but if it's like your superstar and they're just out there like three well, quarters like, speed. Yeah. Yeah, that's like that's it's a bad look for everyone, mm -hmm. and it's going to have long term repercussions. I think people don't think about that. No doubt. Well, listen, Mike, this is awesome stuff. Where can people catch up with you on social, man? Let me get you out of here with that. Oh, well, let's see. Instagram and Twitter are both at Kelly Smash K E L L E Y Smash. Uh, trying to think i suppose you can find me on facebook but i'm not really on there with any strength conditioning stuff i need to be better about the social media anyway but if you need to find me you know find me if you've got any questions you want to come visit crew of city in a normal year uh come on up contact me dm gosh i hope there's a normal year sooner than later man but listen oh. bro truly appreciate your time today man and uh we'll be in touch real soon brother all right awesome jay thank you have Bye, a good man. day good luck out there brother Thanks, man. You too. Cheers.